Hey Merfolk fans, I'm Joe. Thanks very much for joining me today. This video is going to cover all of the sideboard guide decisions uh, for our control matchups. Uh, this uh, Chalice Folk from Emahayashi build of Merfolk is really unique and plays very differently to the traditional stock Merfolk lists. And since M. Hayashi is not online sharing all of his insights into the deck, I've decided to take a deep dive myself and uh, just jam a ton of, of matches and leagues uh, with this Chalice Folk build uh, to get a real understanding of how the deck works. And um, this sideboard guide uh, is kind of a product of my first 50 matches or so with the deck. I'm starting to really understand how it works. It's starting to feel more comfortable in my hands. Uh, and so hopefully the sideboard guide um, will prove very useful to you guys as well. If you appreciate it, uh, please check out my Patreon page, uh, where if you pledge, uh, this document is going to be available uh, as a downloadable PDF. So uh, moving forward, here are uh, the control matchups uh, that I'm going to have sideboarding decisions against. We'll start off with Mono Green Tron. Now, this is a borderline matchup for Chalice of the Void. Uh, it's not a home run. And it's not garbage. They have some really important uh, spells at, at one CMC, uh, especially Expedition Map, Ancient Stirrings, and then they have a whole bunch of other ones that just cycle through their deck. Uh, they have Chromatic Stars and Chromatic Spheres, and um, being able to take them off of those spells can just really jam up their hand and give us some time to develop a board and win a game quickly. Uh, however, in this particular matchup, um, Chalice is going to be way more effective on the play uh, since on our turn two, we can play a second land, jam Chalice with X equals one. Now the opponent has to play their second land, and they don't have too much to do typically on turn two. Uh, maybe they previously played an expedition map, uh, but now they can't really play any of the one drops that are left in their hand. So they'll pass back to us for our turn three when we can do any number of awesome things against them. We could hold up a counter spell uh, to prevent them from resolving an O stone on their turn. We can play a spreading seas. Um, basically, uh, we have the initiative on the play, and it's really important uh, in this particular matchup. On the draw, it's totally flipped. The opponent plays two lands. Maybe they have an expedition map down already, and they're they're threatening Tron. They pass back to us, and if we tap out to play a chalice on our turn too. That gives them a total green light to play their third land, play an Oblivion Stone, and pretty much just um, cancel out our entire turn two and the card that we played with the Chalice. So um, yes, if we have a Spreading Seas, we can play it on turn two instead of Chalice of the Void. But Chalice of the Void doesn't get better as the game goes on. Um, you know, if you get to turn five or turn six and you cast Chalice of the Void... Um, Odds are they're going to have cast all of their one drops already. Yes, it might turn off some subsequent top decks, um, but it's not going to be nearly as impactful as it is on the play on turn two against Green uh, Tron. So I've actually got a different strategy for the play and the draw against Green Tron. Now, the cards that we bring in are going to remain constant. You're going to want to bring in four counter spells, the four deprives, um, four tectonic edges. Now, uh, this is a matchup where tectonic edge really, really shines. Um, being able to keep them off of particular Tron lands um, to keep their their mana count really low is really our, our ticket to victory in this matchup. And um, if you can get two Tectonic Edges down and double activate them when the opponent hits four lands, take them all the way back down to two lands, you're pretty much virtually guaranteed to, to win that game because Tron really needs their lands and they need really specific lands. So Tectonic Edge, uh, amazing in this matchup. And I like to bring in one extra Echoing Truth. Um, it can, if you played out a couple of Spreading Seas and then the opponent cracks an Oblivion Stone, you can bounce all of your Spreading Seas back to your hand with Echoing Truth and then recast them, um, crippling their Tron lands. Uh, additionally, if they land one of their big spells like Ugin or Worm Coil, you can bounce it with an Echoing Truth and then later counter it with a Deprive when they try to recast it. So Echoing Truth, a very flexible spell that we want access to in this matchup. Um, on the play, when we're going to be looking to drop Chalice of the Void on turn two, we can cut four Harbingers, uh, because since we're uh, the aggressor and we're looking to slow them down with Chalice of the Void, um, we're not particularly afraid of um, things like uh, Worm Coil Engine. And anyhow, we have um, 
Trickster to tap down the Worm Coil engine. So Harbinger is really the easiest cut in this matchup, I think. The second easiest cut is all the dismembers. Now, Green Tron does have access to some number of Walking Ballistas, which is typically a very good card against us, but with four Spreading Seas and four Tectonic Edges, um, it's going to be hard for them to land a, a really big Walking Ballista because they're not going to have access to too much mana. So Dismember becomes a little bit less useful, a little bit less necessary against the Walking Ballistas. So that's the easiest next cut. And then past Harbinger, we're going to trim just one Coral Helm Commander. Uh, we often want to leave up mana in the matchup uh, for Deprive, so we can't very regularly uh, pump mana into Coral Helm. However, Coral Helm Commander uh, is quite good in the matchup because uh, if the Tron opponent is sitting with an O-Stone on his side of the board, you can just uh, sit back and level up Coral Helm and try to just push in for 4 damage as many times as the Tron opponent can stomach it. Eventually, they might have to crack their Oblivion Stone just to deal with your one creature, um, since Coral Helm can be such an, uh, an effective standalone threat. Um, so you'll note that in our uh, sideboarding decisions on the draw, uh, we're going to keep all the Coral Helms in and only trim one Harbinger. So let's go ahead and look at that plan on the draw. Again, the same cards come in because they have the same amount of value um, on the play in the draw. But we are going to trim all four chalices just because they become a bit of a liability when we're on the draw. We can still cut all four dismembers, uh, but we are going to have access to more creatures on the draw by leaving in all four helms and three of our harbingers. Uh, access to those extra creatures on the draw is going to allow us to just do our best uh, by presenting uh, a threat. Uh, we have less recourse against all their one drops since we took the chalices out. They're going to have the initiative being on the play, and our best hope of, of stealing games when we're on the draw is by applying pressure, and so having more creatures in the deck allows us to do that. So that's the plan against Green Tron. It's the only uh, matchup in this sideboarding guide where there is um, a different plan for play and draw. But you want to be uh, awake to uh, the possibility that certain cards are going to be better on the play or the draw. It doesn't come up all the time, but it does occasionally. Moving on, we have Mono Blue Tron. It's traditionally a really good matchup uh, for Merfolk. It's a little bit worse uh, for our build uh, here with Chalice Folk because Chalice is a really poor card against Mono Blue Tron. They have virtually no uh, one drops except their expedition maps. So, easy choice to cut all four chalices. Uh, we're going to bring in four counter spells and we're going to bring in four tectonic edges. Uh, same against Green Tron. That's going to be a consistent uh, motif throughout all of our control matchups, bringing in. Uh, the Deprives and the Tectonic Edges. Uh, we're going to cut the Chalices, and we're going to cut two of our four Dismembers. Now we're going to leave in a couple of them to try to deal with Platinum Angel, uh, and we're also going to want to uh, have ways to deal with Walking Ballista. Um, and then we can trim two Harbingers, uh, because they're the least effective of our creatures. All right, so that's eight cards in, eight cards out. Moving on. I should mention quickly that... Um, Mono Blue Tron is still a really strong matchup for Chalice Folk uh, because it can be hard, so hard for them to deal with um, our approach. We have Aether Vials, which make our creatures uncounterable. We have Manlands, which dodge Sorcery Speed Removal. Um, they, do they dodge Oblivion Stone. And uh, if we do get a Lord down, then all of our creatures are suddenly unblockable anyway since they always have Islands in play. So it's still a very uh, favorable matchup. It's just not quite as favorable in Game 1 as... Uh, as stock builds of Merfolk are against Mono Blue Tron. Moving on, we have Blue White Control, uh, which is an interesting one because uh, my intuition told me that Chalice was going to be really good in the matchup, uh, being able to stop Path to Exile, Serum Visions, but the list really gets cut off at those two cards. You know, they only have Path and Serum Vision pretty much. So um, it's just not really high impact. So it's, it's a pretty easy choice to just cut the Chalices in this matchup. Um, we have a lot of great cards to bring in against Blue-White Control. Four Counter Spells, four Tectonic Edges, um, four Relic of Progenitus, keeping them off of Snapcaster value, and uh, one, echo one extra Echoing Truth can be really good in this matchup. Uh, Blue-White Control runs a lot of Supreme Verdicts, and if we have um, a bunch of creatures on the board, Echoing Truth can save uh, one or more of our creatures to replay them, keep applying a pressure. Uh, it can also bounce a Detention Sphere, um, on their end step, bringing back a creature to our side of the board uh, for our attack step. 
It can bounce their Planeswalkers, which then when they try to recast it, we can counter it with Deprive. I, I enjoy having access to two Echoing Truths in, against Blue-White Control. <clears throat> Easy choice to take out the four Cs. Uh, as far as land um, disruption, we've got our four Tectonic Edges replacing the Spreading Cs. Easy choice to take out the four Dismembers. Uh, Chalice is not that great, as mentioned. And Harbinger is the weakest creature. So we've got 13 great cards coming in, 13 uh, subpar or suboptimal cards coming out. Now, Jeskai Control, Grixis Control, Blue Red Control, they're all um, trying to do similar things, but in very different ways. You know, they're trying to control what we're doing, but um, they've got different win conditions and different ways of trying to control us. So uh, Jeskai Control, you can see, has a, and Grixis has a, has a bit more one drops than Blue White Control, so it becomes more of a borderline matchup for Chalice's um, strength in the in these matchups. Uh, as against Blue White Control, we're going to bring in all the counter spells, all the tectonic edges, all the relics. Since Jeskai Control doesn't run as many board wipes, um, and they don't run as many detention spheres. Now, Echoing Truth, not as valuable, so we can actually take out our Singleton Echoing Truth. Still taking out the Seas, still taking out the Dismembers, but we're only going to cut two Chalices um, here. We're going to cut that Harbinger, and we're going to cut our Singleton Echoing Truth. So, four, uh, sorry, 12 very strong cards coming in, four not very strong cards, uh, 12, <laughs> 12 not very strong cards going out. So the matchup should get much better post-sideboard. Grixis Control um, is going to run some Delve Threats, like Gurmag Angler. They're going to run um, a lot of Coligon's Command, Snapcaster Mages. So uh, these same 12 cards are going to do a great job. Um, but we are going to see uh, Aether Vial stock drop a little bit because of all those Coligon's Commands. Um, so instead of cutting two Chalices, we're going to cut one Chalice and one Vial, but everything else pretty much remains the same as against Jeskai Control. Moving on to uh, Blue Moon slash Blue Red Control. This, this uh, covers a variety of decks that try to win in different ways, from uh, Through the Breach with Emrakul uh, to just Jace the Mind Sculptor. Um, these decks tend to run Blood Moon, which is why they're called Blue Moon. Uh, Blood Moon is more impactful. It's stronger against Chalice Folk since we run so many man lands. Um, so... Just be prepared for that. It's still not amazing a Blood Moon against us because we do have a lot of basic islands. Um, so again, bringing in the same 12 cards, cutting a lot of the same stuff. In this case, we are going to cut all four chalices because as with blue-white control, they just don't have the density of one drops for us to really bother trying to run chalice. Um, the seas are very weak. The dismembers are very weak. All of these cards are really uh, powerful against these control decks. Um, so again, similarities and differences among all of these uh, different color combination control decks. So it's good to be aware of why we make these subtle um, distinctions in our sideboard uh, choices against them. All right, so moving past them, we have a land destruction deck with Ponza, traditionally one of Merfolk's best matchups. Our Spreading Seas line up exceptionally well against their um, Utopia Sprawls, basically almost three for one them every time by... First of all, reducing their access to their colors. Second of all, um, drawing us a card. And third, it can just destroy their uh, Utopia Sprawl. So very, very powerful interaction against Ponza. We happen to run a playset of Spreading Seas, um, so it's pretty easy to get them on that Utopia Sprawl interaction. Uh, beyond that, just tends to line up really well for us. Uh, there's not a lot of sideboarding that we have to do. Chalice is poor, so we're going to cut all four Chalices and bring in four Counter Spells. Um, they are trying to ramp their mana up to um, big powerful stuff like Inferno Titan. And if you can deprive their Inferno Titan, you're probably just going to win the game. Next up, we have Mardu Midrange. So this could have been included up in the uh, the first video where I was discussing the midrange matchup, matchups. But uh, Mardu tends to be um, a little bit more controlling than, than Jund or Abzan. Uh, so uh, th it is a good matchup for Chalice. They have right around 17 one-drops. So we are going to want to keep all of our chalices in. Um, we're going to bring in all four relics first and foremost since they're trying to fill up their graveyard with instants and sorceries uh, in order to cast cheap bedlam revelers. Um, so keeping their graveyard empty is going to make it much much harder for them to cast those bedlam revelers. For deprive, uh, deprive does really really well in this matchup. Being able to counter a bedlam reveler is excellent. Uh, being able to counter a key piece of removal later in the game is going to be solid. 
And then rounding out our playset of Echoing Truths is going to be one of one of the best spots for Echoing Truth because they have so many tokens between Young Pyromancer and Lingering Souls. All right, so we're going to take out our vials just against uh, as against other mid-range decks because they're poor top decks. And cut all four Harbingers and three Tricksters um, just because the average value of their um, of their creatures is way lower than um, normal so because you're going to be dealing with 1-1 one, one Elementals and 1-1 one, one, um, Spirits. Harbinger becomes a lot weaker. Trickster becomes a lot less necessary. Now the Echoing Truth's bounce effect, I should mention, in addition to being extremely strong against tokens, is, is fantastic against Bedlam Reveler because when they cast the Bedlam Reveler, a trigger goes on the stack that says they have to discard their hand and then draw three cards. If you bounce the Reveler in response to this trigger, the Bedlam Reveler will get discarded along with anything else in his hand. So it's effectively a kill spell while that trigger is on the stack. So Echoing Truth, um, a really, really good card to have access to, and we have the full play set. So uh, that's Mardu Midrange. We've got, we have Jeskai Tempo, uh, which on its face and in a lot of spots uh, in different games look very similar to Jeskai Control. There's a few um, telltale signs that you're playing against one or the other. If you see Search for Azkanta, you're definitely playing against Jeskai Control. If you see um, Geist of Saint Traft, or if you see Spell Queller, you're almost certainly playing against Jeskai Tempo. Uh, so this is a decent matchup for Chalice, right at that threshold uh, with 14 uh, one casting cost spells. As with other matchups, our Deprives, Tectonic Edges, and Relic of Progenitus are going to be very, very good. Um, we're going to take out our Cs. We're going to take out our Harbingers because they're just not doing a good job against things like Spell Queller when they can just recast the Spell Queller. Uh, Geist of St. Traft has Hexproof, so it's not that great. Uh, for the same reason, Dismember is really not amazing. We can leave one um, Dismember in in case an opponent does uh, quell one of our spells, Spell Queller. Having access to a Singleton Dismember is not terrible uh, because it will give us that spell back. And we're, we're going to cut our Singleton Echoing Truth. Uh, it's just similar to Harbinger. A lot of their um, potential targets uh, are just not things that we really want to bounce, or are even just unable to bounce, like uh, Geist of St. Traft. So uh, the same old 12 cards in, and then uh, 12 cards out. Lantern Control is up next, and it happens to be one of our best Chalice matchups. They have 25 one drops and 8 zero drops. So getting down a Chalice on zero or one is going to be great for us here. Um, we're going to add all of our counter spells, all of our relics. Um, relic is interesting because if they have effects like Codex Shredder out, which mill our top our top card, um, if they don't have a lot of those mill effects and they want to get rid of our top deck, they can activate Codex Shredder. But then uh, before we let that resolve, we can crack a relic and draw that card if it's really important to us. So it gives us a way to battle uh, their top deck milling effects. It also just um, helps us cycle through cards and, and, and let us hit one of these high impact cards that we're sideboarding into. Uh, Relic also fights against their academy ruins. Uh, if they want to try to put like an ensnaring bridge back on top of their deck, uh, you can crack the Relic and just exile the ensnaring bridge that's sitting in the graveyard. Uh, anyhow, uh, moving on, we're definitely gonna bring in all of our Echoing Truths to deal with ensnaring bridge. That's sort of their number one way to win against us and uh, Echoing Truth after we build up a board, uh, can bounce their bridges and just let us get in for an alpha strike. We're going to bring in one Tectonic Edge because we want to move our land count from 19 to 20 here, just making it that much more likely that we'll have mana to resolve Chalice uh, earlier in the game. Of course, uh, Tectonic Edge also can hit their um, Inventor's Fair, which is another way for them to grab an Snaring Bridge. It's a way for them to gain life with, uh, you know, Adventure's Fair. That's a really annoying card. So having Tectonic Edge to deal with that is pretty powerful. And also, as I mentioned, uh, Academy Ruins is something that we're going to want to be able to deal with. Uh, the four Cs can come out because um, we don't need access to Island Walk really at all. Uh, four Dismembers, they don't play creatures. And then beyond that, uh, we can very, very comfortably trim four Lords. Um, Lords are actually detrimental to getting under an ensnaring bridge in the early part of the game. We just want to have a whole bunch of two drops, uh, sorry, two two power creatures and uh, man lands just to swing in for six or eight as many times as we can before they get their hand size down uh, below two. 
effectively shutting off any of our attacks, at which point hopefully we have an echoing truth to finish them off. But uh, many times, lords will just be um, really unplayable, because if we, if we were to put them on the table, our creatures would get three power, and if the opponent only has two cards in hand, now we can't attack through um, an ensnaring bridge. So let's see, that's going to be four cards in and, uh, sorry, <laughs> 12 cards in and 12 cards out. Moving on, we have Scred um, slash Mono Red Control. They're slightly different decks. Um, they go by the same name a lot of the time. Um, now, this is not a good matchup for at all for Chalice because they only have around 10 one-drops, and they actually play a play set of Chalice themselves in their main decks. So um, they're trying to attack other decks with Chalice, so it's going to be hard to attack them with Chalice. Easy choice just to take all those out. Replacing them, we've got four Deprives. These are decks that also run, like Lantern, a uh, playset of Ensnaring Bridge. So being able to counter an Ensnaring Bridge is huge, and being able to bounce Ensnaring Bridge is huge. So four counters in, three Echoing Truths in. Get rid of the Chalices. They do have, different builds have different types of creatures. You'll see Pia and Kirin. Uh, you'll see Goblin Rabble Master. Sometimes you'll see Storm Breath Dragon. This member effectively answers all those guys, but they don't have a lot of threats. So you really don't need a ton of dismembers. So we'll cut two of them. And since they're mono red, uh, mono red deck, it might seem like a good choice to cut all of our spreading seas because we can't really control their mana. If we look at it similar to being like a, to being similar to goblins, where it's a mono red deck, um, then sure, maybe we want to cut our spreading seas because they just run mountains and we can't really stop them from drawing mountains. However, these decks run Blood Moon and. If they get down a Blood Moon and we only have like one basic island, we're going to be pretty stuck for most of the game. This is where Spreading Seas uh, comes in for us in this particular matchup. Um, if they land a Blood Moon, we can put the Blood Moon on one of our Muta Vaults, which is just acting as a mountain for the time being. But um, if you play a Spreading Seas after they play Blood Moon, that mountain turns into a, an island. And having access to two islands is much better than having access to only one island, as you guys surely know playing this deck. Uh, so we're really keeping Spreading Seas in for a funny reason uh, in this matchup. We don't want to lose to Blood Moon, and um, Spreading Seas just gives us a way to do that. Spreading Seas also increases our chances of drawing into uh, high-impact cards like Deprive and Echoing Truth with its card drawing. So moving on past Scred and Monoride Control, we have 8-Rack rounding out the control matchups. It's not a deck that you see very often. I haven't seen it in a really long time, but it happens to be an excellent matchup for Chalice of the Void. They have 25 one drops everything from uh, Shrieking Affliction and the Rack, their sort of main win conditions, those are one drops, to um, removal like Fatal Push, to hand disruption like uh, Inquisition and Thought Seize and Raven's Crime. All of those things are stopped by Chalice on one, so we want to always have our play set of Chalice in the deck against 8 Rack. We're going to bring in just like against Scred, four Deprives, four, uh, three Echoing Truths, and then we're just going to go ahead and trim all of our dismembers. And we can leave in one of our spreading seas to turn off uh, like one of their muta vaults. It's one of the few uh, ways they have of dealing damage to us. All right, and spreading seas, of course, draws us a card, which is always great against eight rack when they're trying to just uh, get all of the cards out of our hand. So that rounds out the uh, control matchups. Um, again, this is the sideboarding guide for M Hayashi's uh, so Chalice of the Void approach to Merfolk. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I've been doing a deep dive uh, for the last few weeks, trying to wrap my head around the deck and share my knowledge with you other Merfolk players. Uh, please tune in for the next video where I will um, finish up this sideboarding guide uh, with all of the combo matchups. If, let's see, uh, if you have any uh, observations, please share them down in the comment section below. If you haven't subscribed already, please do that. And yeah, check out my Patreon page. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.